practically I was met by a police officer who told me, get back down in that nigga. And I ran, ran right past him. Now, Sean, you and I both used to work for the police department. You know, uh, response time is seven minutes to date. Mm-hmm. But ironically, the police were right there while the building was still shaking. And I remember running right past him, running under his arms and making my way to the outside of the church. Again, not having a clue as to what was going on. But I started to smell the, the, the pungent odor of dynamite. And gunpowder. And you you would wonder, well, what do you know about that? And you're 11 years old. Well, cap pistols. Mm-hmm. The crackers that all the boys played with back then. And then I realized the church had been bombed. And seconds later, I saw the adults, then some of them being escorted from the main auditorium upstairs down that huge stairwell. Many were bleeding. Many were crying and hysterical, and then people were looking for their loved ones. And I realized I hadn't seen my brother, so I went back down in the basement looking for him. And the fireman stopped me. He said, son, where are you going? And I said, I'm looking for my brother. Is that okay? He said, go right ahead. Now, you're talking about a church that had been bombed. Mm-hmm. You don't know if there's a second bomb. You don't know as a result of the first bomb that the place would collapse. But he sent an 11-year-old boy back in there to search for his brother. So I went to the classroom where he should have been and called for his name, looked under the table and stuff. No one was there. And I came back out the second time. I was in the church orchestra. This time I remember I grabbed my clarinet and I was sitting there and I came out. And fortunately, I saw my brother Kenneth with his classmates and they were around a big oak tree that was in front of 16th Street Church along with his Sunday school teacher. And and I made sure he was OK. He was crying as as was his his uh, classmates. And, we we stood on the corner because my dad was working for the AG Gaston Motel at the time. We were right up the street a block away. And, and Sean, you should know this, that two or three months earlier, the, the motel had been bombed. And and we didn't, my brother and I didn't know anything about it till the following morning uh, when we woke up to the FBI and a lot of people in the house. And my mother explained to us that the motel had been bombed. And so everybody in my home had been victimized by Birmingham bums, except my mom. Uh, the following week after the uh, September 15th uh, bombing, was, we spent visiting grieving families. And, and of course, we were a mess. And there were no counselors for black boys and girls, and certainly we needed it. But my grandmother did the best she could in trying to console us and calm us down because we were afraid of everything. Right. We were afraid to leave the home after being almost killed in the church that was supposed to be the place of refuge and protection. But my grandmama said to us, if you want to get beyond this issue of racism, you need to pray, have faith, walk upright, and get a good education. She said that all the time, Sean, but this time she added something. She said, you need to do something for somebody else. Uh, Denise, Carol, Addie, and Cynthia, the four girls that were killed, won't get a chance to live out their lives. You got to do your part and theirs too. God spared you for a reason because it could have been four little boys versus four little girls. And so that's my story. I could go on and on, but Birmingham has changed quite a bit since then and it took a better, but there still have, there's still a lot to be done, uh, in terms of race relations and fairness and and, 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 and making Birmingham be the place it should be in order for people to live comfortably and equitably. And, and Dale, you know, a, a lot of people look at what happened in 1963 as history, something that happened a long time ago. Obviously, it's living history for you. But but I say, you know, some of the perpetrators from incidents that you mentioned in bombings are still alive. Some of their children and grandchildren are still making policy. So you can you talk about what that legacy of racism means in a place like Birmingham and some and, and places like we live in the South. But what what is the, the legacy of that racism that can persist still today? Well you know if you if you if you know the story of Birmingham, some of the perpetrators weren't even indicted and prosecuted until forty years later. You and I both know that's not justice. Right. And so they were able to walk three free and live peaceably. And, and, and live without any type of threat of incarceration or anything like that until 40 years later. And it had to do with, uh, several elected officials who happened to have been 
uh, the the some of the officials who who decided to revisit that case. But you're right. Some of their uh, kids, some of their grandkids uh, live today and some of them perhaps are serving in the state legislature, not just in Alabama, uh, but in Texas. And I contend that, you know, once that attitude is perpetrated on and on and on and on, you know, anybody who practices something long enough become good at it, including what I call bovine fecal matter. They become <laughs> good at it. And, and it continues. And uh, as we look at the news and read the newspaper today, we see the results of it that continues. And again, a lot of work has to be done in order to change things for the better and make things livable and equitable for people of color. You know, Dale, over the last year, we've seen an increase in violence in the Asian American community, including, sadly, the, the recent events in Atlanta where, where 10 people were killed. Do you see any parallels between what's going on today with the Asian American community and what you were witness to in Birmingham growing up? Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it began, in my opinion, it began with our former president who stoked that type of negative attitude about Asian Americans. Um, Certainly, the things that we all know that he did didn't help the situation because only the only thing that happened is, is that it is excited and it sort of gave permission for people to be mean and hate exercise hatred towards uh, the Asian Americans. Former President Trump did everything he could in order to make this happen. And um, again, we need to be careful about who we elect in the public public office and who we consider leaders, because in some instances, they don't have all Americans um, um, in their best interests. They wanted they're wanting to uh, they have a, an agenda. And that agenda, as you all mentioned, started way back in the 60s and even way back into slavery and the Civil War era. This is Deconstructing Dallas, Ryan Trimble, Sean Williams. We're visiting with Dale Long. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Deconstructing Dallas, Ryan Trimble, Sean Williams. Sean, it's a pleasure to be joined today by Dale Long. Uh, man, if you don't know his story, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, we're getting to share share some of his, his story with our listeners today. Now, Dale, last summer, Sean and I, uh, you know, Sean's brainchild, and, and I was happy to, to be along for the ride. We did, a, we did a podcast on race and racism after the uh, the George Floyd killing. I think for a lot of Americans, uh, that moment, what, seeing that video, that was an awakening moment. Where do you think we are as a nation regarding racism uh, and race relations as we approach the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death? Well, we again, we still have a lot to do. You know, the entire universe saw what happened to George Floyd. There was no doubt as to um, uh, what made that happen. It was racism. Who, who places their knee on the neck of a, a man for eight minutes and 40 seconds? And every now and then he would raise his leg to see if the man was still breathing. And then you had three other police officers standing by watching it happen and did nothing with George Floyd's friends standing by begging him, begging the police officer to, to free him and not kill him. The man was handcuffed. He was face down. He, he, he was no longer struggling to free himself. And we all saw this man die right in front of our faces. And the, the most terrifying moment to me is when he called for his mama. This grown man, his mom had been dead for years, but he called for his mama because at that point I gathered that he knew that his life was going to be snuffed out 
in a few seconds. So it's no doubt in my mind, and I understand that the jury has been selected for that case. What is it, Milwaukee? And and, and I'm hoping that justice is served uh, in making sure that the, the, the police officer that, that did that is punished accordingly and that perhaps other people won't go back and do the same thing. Because if he gets free with it, if he gets away with it, then we unfortunately will probably see it happen again and again. Dale, you've been part of Big Brothers Big Sisters for, for many years. You mentored a, a number of young men and had a chance to speak to a lot of young people along the way. So I'm interested to know, you know, what what's your perspective of, of how they see race? What have you heard some of these young people talk about regarding the racism and, and the conversations that you all have had? Sean, let me, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it kind of ties into uh, my Birmingham story. See, at the time of the bombing, uh, and when my grandmother told me about praying and having faith and, and all of that and doing something for other people, then at the funeral of three of the four girls, I got a chance to look into the face of Dr. King. I was just 10 feet away from him. And when you combine that moment with what my grandmama told me, I called it my epiphany experience. Years later, I was led to Texas Southern. I went there on a band scholarship. And while at Texas Southern, I found out about uh, Big Brothers, Big Sister Sean. You're like this at a fraternity meeting, an house <laughs> meeting. Of course, and, I like and, that. And right, right after school, uh, right after I completed my degree with the work for, for NASA, the first day on the job, a guy introduced, welcomed me to the company and told me how glad he was there for, for, for me to be there. And then before he walked away, he said, hey, you ever thought about being a big brother? And he got me involved. Uh, he taught me into doing it. And since then, I've had seven little brothers and, um, and moving to Dallas. I took up where I left off in Houston. And it's been a blessing for me to do that. But I found that as my calling as a result of what I experienced as an 11-year-old. So I tell kids the same thing. My grandma, pray, have faith, walk up right, get a good education, and then prepare yourself. Because if I've given up myself, and in the case of my current little brother, we've been matched for 10 years. We've been all over the place. We've been on national TV, Cowboys games, you name it. We've been all over the place. The Morton Milestone Symphony, Dallas Symphony. We've visited colleges throughout the area. You know, he has no other way to go but up if he does some of the things that we've talked about. But when he asks me, when he talks to me about the things that he sees on TV, about police brutality and other things that get kids in trouble, we talk about image, sagging pants, being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Knowing if we start driving, the police stop you, keep your hands at 10 to 2. Yes, sir. No, sir. Don't argue with them because they're going to win. But then when it's in the final analysis, I tell him, I said, you know, just like my grandmama told me 60 years ago, pray, have faith, walk up right, get a good education, and then prepare yourself to do something in a positive way for other people. Dale, you know, as I mentioned, our first podcast was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, you know, Sean had the, the right idea uh, to, to title our podcast after Dr. King's, Dr. King's book. So as someone who, who mentors the next generation, I, I ask you the question, where do we go from here? Or maybe, you know, where are we going? What's the outlook? Well, you know, I would, I would ask that uh, your, your, your listeners um, consider becoming mentors themselves. There are hundreds of kids out there who need people in their lives to give them a ray of light, an opportunity some things that they probably would not have access to. You know, just a, just imagine, you know, my little brother, um, the one I'm matched to now, he's been in a high-rise building downtown Dallas. That was overwhelming to him. Something we take for granted. We do it all the time in our jobs and our uh, the things that we do from day to day. But that in and of itself was overwhelming. So, you know, I urge your listeners to become mentors, to uh, practice some some tolerance of people who don't look like themselves. There's, it's been tried all over Dallas. Dallas done a table and a bridge building dialogue and all of that. But again, there's still more work to be done because there's issues with jobs and education, environmental justice, 
um, police reform, gun control, as we've all talked about this week, 